Hi, everybody. Um, very glad to be with you today. To welcome to today's resource community information session. Today, the 10th of December 2020. Uh, my name is Steve Ward. I'm a director of engagement and compliance within, within the Department of Resources. It's my pleasure to be your MC today. I'd like to respectfully acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land, which many of you are on today, and elders, both past, excuse me, past and present. In particular, I acknowledge the Auburn Hackwood, Durambal, Gangaloo, Iman, Wadja, and Woolly Woolly peoples. I also recognise those whose ongoing efforts to protect and promote Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures will leave a lasting legacy for future elders and leaders. So these resource information sessions are a collaboration between the Department of Resources, the Department of Environment, Gasfields Commission Queensland, Land Access Ombudsman and the Land Court of Queensland. Our collective aim is that you leave today's session with an awareness of resource activity in your broad landscape, uh, an understanding of rights and obligations when it comes to land access and environmental regulation, uh, how any disputes can be resolved without unnecessary cost or stress, uh, and where to go for help. Uh, today, you'll be hearing from Luke Croton from the Department of Resources, Andrea Green of the Office of the Land Access Ombudsman, Member James McNamara of the Land Court of Queensland, Daniel Phipps of the Department of Environment and Science, and myself of the Department of Resources. So in the past, we've done these sessions face to face, but broadened the delivery uh, in 2020 to include webinars. Now, with the wonders of technology, this can occasionally be uh, lead to frustrations as well. So we really appreciate your patience with any delays there might be in between presentations or flicking between our presenters. We are coordinating the presenters from various locations across the state and, and the strength of the internet may vary. So please bear with us. The presentations will be followed by a question and answer session. Feel free to submit your questions throughout the whole session uh, into the Q&A tab in the taskbar. And this should be at the bottom of your screens and there should be an icon with a question mark on it. Now we'll try to answer as many of the questions um, provided to us today, but if we don't get to your question, we will follow up with you afterwards. Later in the session, um, there'll be a live link to our feedback form in the Q&A section. We'd be really grateful if you could take a minute. Uh, it shouldn't take too long just to fill out this at the end of the session, please. It's really useful information for uh, for us to be able to improve future delivery of these sessions. So it's our intention to provide the recorded session afterwards for those who are unable to attend, attend today or if any of you would like to listen again. So without further ado, uh, we'll get started with the opening presentation. Now our first speaker is Luke Croton. Luke is Director of the Mineral Assessment Hub in the Department of Resources based in Townsville, a position he's held since 2006. Luke is also a registered valuer, both urban and rural, and he is an associate member of the Australian Property Institute. Luke has held various roles within government over the past 30 years, which has included roles based in Northwest Queensland, Emerald, Maryborough, Dolby, which has seen him undertake major roles in projects like the Ballara to Mount Isa gas pipeline, Century Mine right to negotiate process, Ernest Henry Mine tenure approvals and reviews of various land and resource legislation. So without further without further ado, Luke, I hand over to you. Thank you, Steve, for those kind words. And uh, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners on whose country uh, we meet today, and in particular here in Townsville, the all Kookaburra May people. So uh, in the short time I've got, I will cover off a bit about the Wide Bay Mineral Region, talk a little bit about exploration trends over the last decade in the region, what tenures mean for the Wide Bay Region as far as value, and finally, a bit about the government support that has been provided to the region. So to get underway. So the Wide Bay Burnett region hosts a wide range of mineralisation styles and deposits for epithermal gold, volcanic hosts, porphyry systems, intrusion related and various forms of nickel, cobalt and gold mineralisation. However, the main commodities currently being explored for in the region are things such as gold, copper, bauxite, kaolin, zinc, nickel, cobalt and silica sand. 
the next dot point uh, for those who aren't geologists really means that uh, for the Wide Bay Burnett region, most of the mineralisation is not stuff you find on the surface, the expressions. It actually requires quite a bit of investment from exploration and mining companies to go deeper and down the line cover to find those deposits. And it's important to note that uh, the map, which I'll show you shortly, the southern boundary of the Wide Bay Burnett region abuts the southeast Queensland priority living area, where there is little to no exploration tenure. So next you'll see some maps and they will cycle through uh, over the last 10 years to give you an indication of the coverage that has occurred. So the red indicates granted exploration tenures and green are those areas that were under exploration at the time. Looking at the table there, you can see since 2010 uh, to 2012, there was an increase in exploration tenure. The periods between 2013 to 2019, there's a generally a decrease. The most promising thing is that over the last 12 months, there has been a significant increase of roughly of about 20% in coverage between exploration application and granted tenure. It's important to note that uh, the life cycle of mining from exploration through to evaluation and production tenure generally takes roughly about from the time that initial application for an exploration permit is received to the grant of a production tenure is about 15 years. So the coverage of what tenures mean for the Wide Bay, Burnett and Banana local government areas. I've just separated out in the next couple of slides the banana area because it is solely focused on coal and is generally seen to be, for statistical reasons, not included in the actual Wide Bay area. But we did include today, as I understand, a number of attendees have attended from that area. So for exploration tenure for mineral, covers roughly about 15% of the local government areas in the Wide Bay Burnett. Exploration tenure for coal, about 10% and mineral development licenses, which are an evaluation tenure that companies allows companies to hold ground while they further look at investment opportunities and raise money and plan out the project about 4%. And mining leases, while there's 163 of them, only cover about 0.8% of the local government area. It's important to note that the majority of the MDLs and mining leases generally relate to the banana local government area and are for coal projects. And once again, the significant increase in exploration has really occurred in the last 12 months. So uh, having a look at what the uh, the value of mining means to the Wide Bay area, and thanks for the QRC, Queensland Resources Council, for the supply of the information, and they do do quite a good job on keeping their information available to the public, which we use quite often the value of mining. So I don't plan to go into them in great detail. People can have a look at that for themselves. Uh, but, but roughly the total value of the Wide Bay Burnett region as a equivalent domestic product is about 1 billion and about 6,500 jobs. If you look at banana local government area as a standalone, it's about 937 million and about roughly 5,000 jobs. So it's a significant contribution um, to the economy. So uh, the last slide and uh, just to uh, give a bit of a plug to the Wide Bay Burnett Resources Group uh, and the work that they've been doing working with government to try and uh, promote the Wide Bay area uh, in relation to exploration and mining. So um, the government runs an exploration drilling program called the Collaborative Drilling Initiative and uh, over the last period of years uh, there's been nine previous exploration projects that have been supported through the initiative between 2008 and 2016. Uh, in 2016 the government moved the focus away from the whole of the state to just focus on the Northwest Mineral Province as far as funding and, and supporting initiatives up there. And then it's the Wide Bay Burnett Resources Group that actually uh, put a submission forward to government to open that back up again to the whole state and uh, certainly allowing the Wide Bay Burnett companies to uh, make application. And over the last 12 months, you can see there's been a couple of uh, successful applications uh, where there's uh, governments able to assist in funding those exploration programs because they are quite expensive. So that probably concludes the uh, my presentation, and uh, I thank everyone for their uh, patience, and uh, we'll hand back to Steve. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Luke.
Uh, it was a great presentation, a great overview of the range of current activities uh, in the White Bay Burnett, and Banana areas. Um, we can see there's a wide range of those activities occurring in the landscape. Um, so look, the, the next presenter is actually me. Uh, to give you a bit of a picture of my background, I oversee teams focused on resource community engagement, inquiry and complaint management, and compliance across petroleum, gas, uh, petroleum and gas, I should say, uh, minerals and coal sectors statewide, as well as fossil King. I've worked with state government in community engagement and compliance around resources for almost a decade, and much of that has been centred on land access in the petroleum and gas sector. Um, prior to this, um, I spent a bit, a few years working in environmental consultancy, both uh, in projects around Queensland and also back in the United Kingdom. You can probably tell I've got a, a Pommy accent, and I've also worked within academia. So, without further ado, I will get going. So, uh, in terms of, um, I seem to have skipped over a slide there, unfortunately. Um, let's see if I can go back. Wonderful. How about that? Technology works. Um, so look, in terms of who we are, so engaging with the community and other stakeholders and undertaking compliance activities is a critical role of our department. We want to ensure that Queensland's resources are managed fairly and responsibly. We want to build awareness and preparedness in communities that have resource activities within their landscape. To achieve this, we've got a dedicated unit, the Engagement and Compliance Unit, and we aim to offer a coordinated approach to resources engagement and compliance. So we've got a range of services and staff uh, located across Queensland, um, uh, and that allows um, as much as we can a local presence and boots on the ground. So in terms of what we do, there we go. Um, so first of all, starting off with compliance. So we do work with industry to ensure that the resources sector has the support, guidance and information necessary to meet the statutory obligations. Also, that the resources sector continues to build upon its social license to operate in resource impacted communities by maintaining that compliance. We also seek to ensure our approach to compliance is risk based, transparent, uh, consistent, independent, proportional and fair. The principles and practices that underpin our compliance enforcement activities are within a publicly available compliance framework, compliance strategy and compliance plan. And you can see on the screen the, uh, the compliance framework there. Uh, and uh, I should say that you probably, yep, you can see that there's the link to that underneath. So that actually provides you with the link to uh, a broader page where you can get to either the framework, the, the uh, strategy or the plan from that page. Um, a component of our uh, proactive compliance approach includes uh, desktop and field inspections. We work closely with our assessment hubs, such as the mineral hub, so under Luke's control, uh, to ensure that these activities align with their priorities. Um, in a responsive sense, um, we undertake investigations, um, and that forms another part of our compliance approach, where and in that we want to ensure that decision making remains uh, consistent and transparent and defendable. So in terms of engagement on the proactive side, we uh, do tar targeted delivery of information sessions um, as such as these, uh, question and answer panels uh, about key topics around resources. And we work closely with our, our, uh, our colleagues in Department of Environment and Science, Gasfields Commission, Land Access Ombudsman, Landcore Queensland, and so on uh, to deliver those. We, uh, at least in the past, have attended large community agricultural events such as FarmFest down here in the South, and have regular engagement with stakeholders such as peak bodies, NRN groups, local governments to understand those issues and the topics of interest in their area. And we also engage with industry, uh, so our focus is there on ensuring that they're fully aware of the regulatory framework in which they operate. So updates on legislation and so on. Uh, and then more broadly, as I said, we, we work very collaboratively across a few different entities and agencies. So at the end of the day, we want to deliver the best, um, I guess, best product, best service, uh, across all the different entities. Uh, in terms of responsive engagement, we have a dedicated phone and email service. So we obviously answer and that's the details of that are up on the screen. 
Now, we always try and answer what we can at the time, but if it's a bit more complex, we'll uh, keep the, uh, the inquirer in the loop and, and follow up and, and do the necessary level of, of follow up to get that answer back. Now, I should say at this point, you'll hear a few different contact details today, but I must stress there's no wrong way in for inquiries or complaints. Uh, we understand that sometimes navigating government and uh, services can be a bit tricky. So uh, all the organisations, entities involved in this webinar have a commitment to work together. So, for example, uh, if, we're, uh, if we are approached with an issue that is best addressed elsewhere, we'll aim to do the heavy lifting. So uh, you only have to speak to us once and, uh, and then hopefully uh, minimise the, the burden on you as an inquirer or a, a complainant. So, um, and similarly, uh, where a response involves multiple agencies, we'll look to coordinate with different agencies in that space. Uh, next slide. OK, so a, a really quick whistle stop for uh, the regulatory framework. So today our focus is around kind of minerals and coal, um, so particularly around exploration. So mineral and coal resources generally are owned by the state. However, uh, individuals and companies may apply to explore or extract those resources. So for uh, mineral and coal activities that are approved, they're granted under the Mineral Resources Act 1989, and that's then uh, managed across subsidiary regulations, policies, codes of operation. Uh, and different resource authority types provide different rights to access uh, the, uh, the resource. So just a quick touch on the different types of tenure. Um, that are most relevant to today's information session. It's really uh, the Exploration Permit for Minerals or EPM and the Mineral Development Licence MDL. So uh, in terms of the, the land access, what we'll cover today. So EPMs, um, as Luke uh, mentioned, uh, with a, an Exploration Permit for Minerals, you're able to, and similarly for coal, you can determine what uh, exists essentially in their quality, their quantity, um, uh, and so the activities in that space can be um, quite uh, rudimentary all the way through to kind of geophysical techniques and, and, and some drilling activities. Um, in terms of a mineral development license, so as uh, Luke indicated, this is once you've got minerals that have been discovered, uh, you know there's some uh, existing there and it allows for further studies of a resource and assessment to, uh, of the development the potential of a site. So it's generally granted where there's significant mineral deposits um, with pot potential um, possible economic potential. And finally, mining leases. So this allows them a miner to conduct larger scale mining operations. Uh, it allows machine mining and other activities related to mining and it would operate under an environmental authority. So in terms of the land access framework, uh, for those exploration activities. So uh, Queensland land access laws establish different requirements and rights for landholders and resource companies, depending on the impact of the authorised activities uh, being conducted under the resource authority on the land which the activity is being carried out. So this framework, it falls under the Mineral and Energy Resources Common Provisions Act 2014. And the framework covers, um, as I mentioned, both exploration permits, mineral development licences. So the framework doesn't cover, um, generally doesn't cover um, obligations related to mining claims, mining leases, which have different land access and compensation provisions set out under the Mineral Resources Act 1989. Uh, requirements for preliminary activities, so those activities with minor or, or no impact on the land use, uh, business activities, for example, survey pegging, uh, are different to advanced activities, for example, drilling a well. Um, authorised activities are not permitted to be undertaken on land where the resource authority does not apply. So only part of a property may be affected. Now, where they are affected by resource company activities, landholders are entitled to know what activities have been undertaken. They're entitled to provide feedback into processes associated with advanced activities to the extent that they relate to the landholder. Um, for example, conditions of access and infrastructure layout and receive compensation for impacts associated with those activities. So to facilitate this, the land access laws include a land access code, and I'll move on to that shortly. Um, entry requirements for preliminary activities, so those low impact activities, um, 
from crossing or entering private land outside the resource authority. Um, also provides for a negotiation of a conduct and compensation agreement or a CCA before entering for advanced activities. So those those higher impact activities such as vegetation, for example. So uh, there's also a statutory negotiation and dispute resolution process. And uh, also the worth mentioning that the company cannot enter restricted land without uh, the consent of the landholder. And this is land where uh, there's a legal boundary around it. Um, now, all of this is in a lot more detail within the guide to land access with Queensland. And you can see that on the screen there. There's also the link below. Um, and this kind of outlines a lot of what I'm talking about here. So in terms of the land access code, um, it's a key component of the land access framework. Um, it contains best practice guidelines and, and mandatory conditions related to land access. It's worth noting it's a condition of a resource authority to comply with the mandatory conditions of the land access code. Now these mandatory conditions address numerous issues, um, but you can see the list on the screen there, including reduction of persons, access points, roads, tracks, um, I won't go through all of them, but you can see that it covers quite a lot of different things. Now, just to touch on preliminary activities. Now, a resource company must provide each landholder with an entry notice at least 10 business days before the date they propose to uh, enter uh, the land if they plan to um, uh, enter it for uh, authorised activities or gain access or cross land for the resource authority. So the notice must include a description of the land to be entered, the period when the land will be entered, activities proposed to be carried out, when and where the activities are to be carried out, and contact details for the resource company or their author or sorry, authorised representative. Um, now in terms of, there's also an entry report that's required, and this is generally for uh, expiration, uh, it's generally three months after the period stated in the entry notice. Now this can differ if a waiver notice has been uh, signed by the land holder um, for that entry notification. Um, now unless each land holder and the resource company otherwise agree in writing, the maximum entry period for that preliminary activity um, notification um, is six months for an exploration resource authority. Uh, now it's also worth mentioning the first time uh, that entry notice is issued must also be accompanied by a copy of the relevant resource authority, uh, land access code, uh, any relevant environmental authority for a resource authority, and any code of practice made under the relevant resource act. Now in terms of advanced activities, a resource company cannot generally undertake private, uh, sorry, enter private land to undertake advanced activities. So these are these uh, greater than minimal impact on, on the land or the, the business, uh, unless they've entered into a conduct and compensation agreement, a deferral agreement or an opt-out agreement. Entry notice is still required unless uh, it's part of an agreement or where entry is waived. Um, a resource company is liable to pay negoti reasonable negotiation and preparation costs that those are you know, necessarily and reasonably incurred in the negotiation of the CCA or deferral agreement. Uh, and that, that includes accounting, legal, uh, valuation and agronomies. So where a resource company decides not to continue with the CCA, a landholder is entitled to recover necessary and reasonable costs of the negotiations. Re um, now, I guess in this sense, we recommend that um, uh, in those negotiations, the party get on the same page nice and early in the process and start that, that early communication. Um, now, in terms of what's in the CCA, CCA, oh, I should mention, sorry, before that, you will see on the right-hand side of the screen, I mentioned in the previous screen as well, there's this a graduated negotiation and dispute resolution process. And that really starts out with that notification uh, and there's dis different aspects here. Now, I won't go into a detail here um, at this stage, but that's also covered within that guide. And I think it may maybe that um, it's covered um, by, uh, elsewhere in the, the information session today. In terms of the CCAs, uh, generally they would set out how and when that entry would occur for those advanced activities, how authorised activities should be carried out, and that compensation liability to the landholder. But it can also cover negotiated um, property for spe specific conduct conditions. Um, 
compensation, timing type and amounts, a uh, manner of re resolving disputes, for example. And uh, these are uh, required to be, uh, the agreements are recorded on the titles registry. So it's not the whole uh, CCA, uh, not the whole conduct and compensation agreements. It's just a, a note on the registry that there is one in place. Um, and I should mention this, so the, the CCAs are different to the, uh, the compensation agreements for mining leases. So that brings me to the end of my quick run through and land access for uh, mineral coal exploration. Uh, as mentioned, um, my unit has a, a resource community info line, an email service for any inquiries, concerns or complaints in relation to resources. And I've uh, put these details up on the screen. So I will um, remove, I'm going to attempt to remove um, trial. Right, sorry about this, technology is a wonder. Um, so thank you for bearing with me. So our next presenter is Andrea Green at the Office of Land Access Ombudsman. Uh, Andrea is a senior dispute resolution officer within that office. Um, she grew up in a small country town in New South Wales and, and so understands those challenges facing rural communities. Um, Andrea has 12 years experience in complaints management and dispute resolution, having previously worked in similar roles within the Queensland Ombudsman and the Energy and Water Ombudsman in Queensland. So today Andrea is going to speak to us on the Office of the Land Access Ombudsman's role. So over to you Andrea. Thanks, Steve. Um, there we go. Um, so, um, yeah, thanks, Steve, for that. Um, so, yeah. Uh, I am here to speak about what we do. Um, we exist primarily uh, to improve the quality of land access interactions between landholders uh, and resource holders in Queensland. Um, our primary role is to investigate disputes involving alleged breaches of conduct and compensation agreements and make good agreements. Um, in order to investigate, uh, there needs to be an existing uh, conduct and compensation agreement or make good agreement. agreement. Um, and a reasonable a belief that the other party is not complying with their obligations under the agreement. Um, and we also require that there's been a reasonable attempt to resolve the matter. Um, we, uh, we do operate independently of government um, and we assess all parties' positions, uh, provide advice and make recommendations about how disputes could be involved. Um, we aim to do that as quickly and efficiently as possible with very little formality. Um, another part of our role is to identify systemic uh, issues, reporting them uh, and providing advice to government and industry to improve the land access landscape and encourage best practice. So uh, as an ombudsman, um, we're a referee, we're not a judge. Uh, it's not our role to determine which version of events is correct. We can only make recommendations, which no party is, is bound to or is required to follow. However, there is an expectation that uh, if we make a recommendation, then it will be followed. Um, it's not legally binding, binding but our recommendations can be taken into account uh, if a matter is referred to the land court. Um, we, we simply look at the documentary evidence before us to identify what is a fair and reasonable outcome. Um, some of these agreements between landholders and resource holders can last for years uh, and one of our focuses is on improving and preserving the long-term relationship in the parties. Um, this uh, it's just a little map that we've put together. Um, when Jane became Land Access Ombudsman, she wanted something that was simple, that provided a very clear um, path or direction that people could take in the event that they uh, were experiencing issues in relation to land access. 
Um, and so this just gives people a little bit of a, a direction about uh, which agency, whether it's us, um, the Department of Resources, the Department of Environment, wherever it might be, that they can go to to get some, some assistance um, for whatever dispute they might have. Um, the benefits of coming to us is that we're free, fair and independent. As I said before, we're independent of government and we're not subject to direction by anybody. Uh, we try to resolve disputes as quickly and as informally as possible. We don't require that the dispute resolution clause has been uh, followed in the, um, in the agreement first. Uh, we just require that there's been a reasonable attempt to resolve the issue. Uh, and because we are a free service, this can save parties time, money and a lot of stress. Um, our process is relatively simple. Uh, when the initial dispute is referred to us, we find out as much information as we can to determine if we can in, uh, formally investigate the issue. Uh, that could include finding out what, if any, attempts have been made to resolve the dispute, um, including if it's been previously before the land court or uh, investigated by another department. Uh, we can request further information from both parties and review the uh, either the conduct and compensation agreement or the make good agreement. If we do decide to investigate, our dispute resolution team will take reasonable steps to look into and help resolve the issue. That could include requesting even more information uh, from either party or both parties. Um, and even potentially contacting other government departments for information. We can hold meetings and interviews with each party, either separately or together. Um, we can undertake site visits uh, and inspections. We can provide alternative dispute resolution options. Uh, we can consult with entities and technical uh, ex experts for advice. Um, because we are focused on preserving the long-term relationship between the parties and finding a mutually beneficial, beneficial really outcome, the investigation might in, uh, involve uh, shifting into a facilitation stage uh, where we just keep the case open and check in regularly with both parties uh, until all of the agreed actions have been completed. Once our investigation is complete, uh, we'll issue a draft notice of investigation uh, outcome to both parties uh, and invite them to respond. Um, we consider comments from both parties uh, before issuing the final notice of investigation outcome. Uh, if the dispute has been resolved as a result of our investigation, we'll include details of that resolution. If either party does not feel the, the, the matter is resolved, uh, the notice will include advice about the merits of each party's uh, position, uh, our recommendations and reasons for the advice and recommendations. Um, some common issues that we've seen or that we've uh, heard from, um, from uh, people who have brought disputes to us, uh, they centre around biosecurity and weed washdown certificates. Um, something that we hear frequently uh, is in relation to weed washdown certificates either not being completed correctly or not at all, um, that they're out of, that the weed washdown certificates are out of date um, and uh, have been presented or that the agreed processes for these certificates have not been followed. Um, damage and disrespect to property is also another big one we've, we've seen. Uh, we've heard about fences being cut without the landholder's consent, rocks, fence posts and other items being left on property uh, to cause a hazard for landholders, rubbish and other matter being uh, left in paddocks, gates not being left in the appropriate um, state, um, landholders locking the gate on resource companies uh, as a way of trying to force them into comp complying with, uh, you know, what, what practices they would like them to undertake. Um, so um, the parties' relationship breaking down to such a point uh, that they're no longer communicating or communicating solely through lawyers, uh, contractors and other, and other um, staff not receiving contact of, oh, sorry, 
not receiving a copy of the relevant CCA or MGA uh, and not understanding the requirements of the property uh, and a failure to set uh, reasonable expectations or a misalignment of the understanding of the clauses in the CCA or the MGA. Uh, there are some things that we can't investigate. Um, so we can't investigate when a CCA or an MGA is under negotiation or subject to a minimum negotiation period or cooling off period. Uh, we can't investigate uh, the content of legislation or government policies. Uh, decisions made by, cab by cabinet, a minister or chief executive of a government department, uh, a matter that is or has been the subject of a court proceeding or arbitration, uh, a matter that is or has been the subject of an investigation by a government department, uh, compensation agreements for mining leases and mining claims under the Mineral Resources Act, uh, access agreements and matters outside of Queensland. Um, so a dispute can be lodged, lodged with us through our online form uh, by filling in one of our dispute forms, which is also available on our website, uh, by sending us um, a letter or an email um, or free call to our 1800 number during business hours. Um, and so more information about us can be found on our website, um, www.lao.org.au. Uh, you can also put your name on the list to receive uh, these slides and future updates that we might have. Um, and we're also available to come to your team to present um, if you would like us to um, about our jurisdiction and answer any questions you might have. Uh, that concludes our presentation. So I'll hand back to Steve. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks very much, Andrea. Um, that was a very informative presentation uh, on the role of the Ombudsman uh, and that they play in, in assisting with dispute resolution for existing agreements are really great. Thank you. Um, look, just as a, a quick reminder, um, please feel free to submit your questions in the Q&A panel. And, uh, and also a reminder, again, that we'll, uh, we'll be posting the link to the electronic feedback survey at the end of the Q&A session. So please uh, feel free to uh, fill that in. We would really appreciate it. Uh, so on to our next speaker. So we're very pleased to have with us today our next speaker, Member James McNamara of the Land Court of Queensland. Member McNamara has built a distinguished legal career and also served as a senior public servant. Member McNamara has served as a member of the Native uh, Title Tribunal since 2014 and previously held the position of Assistant Director General uh, of Queensland's former Department of Natural Resources and Mines. Member McNamara was appointed as a new member of the Land Court in February 2020 and from these and other experiences, Member McNamara has acquired strong expertise in land management and administration, environment and resources, as well as native title and cultural heritage. So without further ado, I hand over to you, Member McNamara. So just bear with us here. Um, we can't hear Member McNamara at the moment, but uh, just bear with us. We'll just uh, sort through this. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yep, that's great. Thank you. Okay, sorry about that. Um, <laughs> sorry, what I was saying was uh, um, uh, I appreciate that some people from some of the earlier comments uh, on the meeting chat might not have access to the uh, video screen, so they may not be able to see the slides. So I'll do my best to, uh, to paint a picture. Um, briefly, I'll talk about the role of the Land Court and how you can use and access um, the Land Court. Uh, very briefly, we are, uh, in the scheme of things, a pretty small organisation. We're made up of the President and three members. We're based here in uh, Brisbane. Uh, we have a Judicial Registrar and we have a Registry and staff. Um, Whilst we're based in South East Queensland, we, our, our jurisdiction is clearly um, statewide and we get out there whenever we can and whenever it's appropriate to, to do so. Um, 
the um, the jurisdiction and what we're talking about today is about um, principally landholder issues to do with to do with access um, by explorers um, onto private land and uh, covering that that area that Steve was talking about uh, principally with to do with um, conduct and compensation um, agreements. The tribunal, uh, sorry, the court has jurisdiction, specific jurisdiction under the Common Provisions Act. Um, I think um, Steve also mentioned um, the Mineral Resources Act, which we're not talking about today, but we do deal with objections to the grant of mining leases and objections uh, to environmental authorities as well. We deal with valuation appeals. We have jurisdiction to do with cultural heritage and uh, acquisition of land uh, issues. Uh, if we go to the next slide, which is um, a flow chart. Uh, there we are. So the the area, the things on that flow chart that are not blue is where we, the land court, might have some role. The process is a very um, uh, you know stylized uh, out, outline of the um, the process under the Common Provisions Act. So when parties get to that point where they're trying, or they're, they're, they're negotiating or attempting to negotiate, things might not be going all that well, and they um, uh, issue a, an ADR election notice, um, that's a, an opportunity for the land court to potentially take, uh, take a bit of a role. Um, if we go to the next slide, that role is in three areas, so to do with negotiations, we have a role in decisions and decision making and a role in enforcement and variation. So dealing first with negotiations on the next slide. Processes that are available, um, simply put mediation, preliminary conferences and case appraisal. So the, the mediation side of things, um, that can be, be without making an application to the court for some determination in relation to the CCA. Um, before you get to that point, there's an opportunity to go to what we call, what's known as the um, ADR, Land Court ADR panel, and I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail in a minute. If parties are, have made an application to the Land Court to try and resolve things to do with the CCA, um, parties can ask the court to direct mediation and uh, that request would be looked at clearly in a, or usually in a, in a positive way, anything that might uh, go towards resolving a matter rather than litigating it is something we would certainly support and certainly advocate. The second point is about preliminary conference and that's in that situation where parties have, got, have brought a matter to the land court to see if it can be resolved. And uh, before getting um, too far down the track, um, we, we, we ask the parties to participate in a preliminary conference, and that's usually conducted by our judicial registrar, and, uh, or it can be just, um, conducted by another member. And the objective is really to have a bit of a discussion. It's not a hearing, but just to see where the opportunities might be to, uh, to see a matter resolved. Naturally, we have you know Chinese walls between the member who might be conducting that type, that type of preliminary conference and the member who might ultimately have to hear and determine uh, issues that are in dispute. The third matter on that list is case appraisal, and through our ADR panel, um, a, and it's it's um, a request that's made to someone to look at material which is provided by the parties and to effectively come to a conclusion about where that person sees this matter landing in terms of an outcome. And if, and, and if the parties um, accept that decision, that can become uh, a binding decision. Now, the person who would undertake that appraisal is a person who would be agreed by the parties, and uh, it would be a person with the necessary and appropriate skills and expertise to be able to undertake that appraisal. So it's not a, it's not a decision of the court, but it's a decision by someone um, with experience and knowledge of a particular area who might be trusted by the parties to undertake that role. And if the parties can enter into that sort of process on the understanding that they would accept the decision of that person, it can be a pretty um, efficient and um, uh, uh, cost-effective way of 
uh, dealing with matters. On the next slide, um, I just set out a bit about the the ADR panel, which uh, which I talked about. So, if you look on the Landcourt website or Google, you know, Landcourt ADR panel, it'll bring up information about what the panel is and what uh, what functions they can perform. Importantly, the ADR panel is it's a list that's managed by the court. It's people who have particular expertise in matters that are, that are part of our jurisdiction. And in respect of, of the you know, land access and issues we're talking about today, it won't necessarily be a lawyer that you might be looking for. It might be someone who's you know, an agricultural scientist or someone who's uh, um, got expertise in environmental economics or, or something like that. You can see, you can look at the panel, you can look at who they are, you, you can see their, their qualifications and experience, you can see what type of rates they charge for their services, and you can go directly to these people um, with the agreement of the other party to, to see if you can reach some sort of resolution. So long story short, there are a, a selection of people who meet certain criteria to get onto that list who, are, who hold particular expertise in areas which are part of the jurisdiction um, of the court. And that panel can offer those mediation services and case appraisal services, whether or not you've brought an application to the land court. You can go to that list anytime and, and access um, those people. It's a fee for service, but um, from my experience, it's um, it's a, it's a the fees are and, you know, I suppose people can judge it for themselves, but I, in my view, they're pretty reasonable. The next slide talks about the nature of decisions that the, the tribunal make, sorry, the court makes, and these are when, when applications are made. So if parties are having a bit of a, a bit of a, a blow over what ADR process to follow and how to go about it, an application can be brought to the court to, to help resolve that. Um, if parties are unable to resolve their conduct and compensation agreement, an application can be brought to the court and a hearing conducted to, to attempt to resolve, sorry, to, well, not an attempt to resolve, to make a decision about those particular issues. Often it'll be compensation, it'll be the first, first issue dealt with and sometimes the rest of the conditions then fall into place, but, uh, but not necessarily. Um, the next um, form of decision is about access outside of the tenement area. So if you've got natural, you know, a landholder with 100,000 hectares and the tenement area is, is you know, 40, you know, 400 hectares in a particular area, but they might have to cross other parts of that person's property to get there, there can be some dispute about that. That's an application that can be brought to the court and a decision made and disputes about access to restricted land. Steve mentioned restricted land earlier, so uh, things like stockyards, wells, homesteads, um, getting within a, a certain um, uh, limit, a, a certain air, uh, distance from there can, can cause dispute. Um, and uh, sometimes an explorer might need to bring an application to see if they can get closer in particular um, circumstances. Um, the next slide is about the enforcement and variation role that we have. So um, if we've decided matters about compensation, sometimes um, uh, there'll be issues to do with enforcement or variation of conditions because circumstances might have changed in the course of exploration activity. Um, parties can't agree about um, the particular form of the uh, uh, agreement and how it might need to be um, amended or in their view it might need to be amended, uh, that's something that can be the subject of an application to the court and, uh, and we can uh, um, uh, either conduct an inquiry to, to resolve it or um, again, you know, something that might be the subject of ADR that can help resolve that sort of issue. And the final one on that list is about the breach, uh, a breach of the conduct and compensation agreement can be brought to the court as well. Um, the other half of the, um, the discussion was about uh, using the land court. Uh, the next slide um, identifies what um, is in our act about the way we operate, which is in, in an accessible, fair, just, economical and expeditious way. So unlike a lot of other courts that are um, uh, uh, must strictly apply, for example, um, the rules of evidence, 
um, the land court operates in a far uh, less formal way than those courts. The first dot point talks about the procedural assistance service, and I highly recommend um, again that uh, anyone interested look at, at that. Uh, Google it, it's very easy to get to from our website, but if not, just Google Procedural Assistance Service Land Court and it'll get you there. Lots of drop down menus answering just about any question that you might have about um, what the court does and how you might go about engaging with the court. Um, so it'll have all the forms there that would need to be filled out, but also some guidance and instructions about how to, how to use those. Where it says they formulate claims, well, it's not a case of writing out the application for a particular party, but it's helping guide the parties as to how they might fill in certain uh, aspects of the applications. Um, the Procedural Assistance Service does allow parties to uh, email the court and, and make an appointment to speak to someone about these things too. So you're not just left to try and work it out. If you're having some difficulty with that, you can actually uh, make an appointment and uh, someone from the registry will speak to you and, and help you uh, through the process. The, um, so all of those things on that list there about preparing evidence, witness statements and so on, there are references to, those, to what might be involved in that and how to go about it. Um, on that procedural assistance um, page uh, on our website. Uh, when we do actually conduct hearings, um, uh, as, if, as, as, as best we can, we like to do them in the area where the particular uh, matter uh, or issue arises. And uh, we'll usually try and start with a site inspection to help us get a, a clearer picture of, uh, of what uh, the issues are. And that helps guide us in, in reaching our um, decision. The next slide really just um, is a bit of advice about parties um, to, you know, any party uh, involved in any of these matters to how they how they might think about the way they approach these matters. Um, stay informed, stay involved. So don't just hand over the reins to to someone else to to run these things for you. Keep informed and keep control. Um, of the process is advice that we uh, we tend to give. Um, and uh, just remember, um, if you look at the next slide, uh, when it comes to people who are um, representing a party in a particular matter, it's your matter, you're instructing them, they're not instructing you. You can break down the services that are, um, that are being provided so that uh, you might have a, a legal advisor assisting in, in one aspect, but not all aspects, or a tenure administration service in some aspects, aspects, but not all aspects. It's a matter for you. You look at the the instructions, you know, uh, that you're giving, making sure that they're clear, knowing that the person who's acting for you is appropriately skilled and has um, the, uh, the the right um, uh, in, you know, has your interests at heart, uh, holds the appropriate insurance and um, uh, there, because of the implications that that might have uh, for things such as costs. Finally, when it comes to matters to do with uh, the conduct of hearings in the land court, uh, on the last slide, I just say a bit there about, um, about the role of expert witnesses. And in, in our jurisdiction, when it comes to things like the, the conduct and compensation agreements, when it comes to particularly the compensation and the impacts that access might have, the expertise that comes into play there can be quite wide uh, ranging. So you can have, you know, agricultural economists, you can have hydrologists, you can have, um, uh, you know, horticulturalists. There can be a whole range of expertise that might be relevant to determining what sort of compensation might be for the inconvenience that's suffered by a landholder. Those people are experts, their duties to the court. So they're not, whilst they might be engaged by one party, their obligation as an expert and to have that very um, specific um, uh, 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 you know, uh, level of, of um, significance given to their evidence, uh, their expertise is to the court. And uh, so they, they're, they're impartial when it, when it comes, comes to a, a hearing. Um, uh, so uh, their duty to the court, as the slide says, overrides uh, their duty to the person who uh, who engages them. That's just a little bit of background information about how 
um, the experts operate in the land court jurisdiction. Uh, so uh, thanks for that. Um, it's uh, very rushed. I appreciate that um, uh, uh, I couldn't recommend more highly to, to go to the website because there's so much information freely available there. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Member McNamara. Uh, it's a fantastic presentation on the role of the land court and the alternate dispute resolution options now available there and including the role of the uh, dispute resolution panel. Very interesting. Um, so I think it's been made clear there's a, a range of expertise uh, available at, uh, at the person's disposal here should the needs ar need arise. And I do stress that. I guess we've we've uh, uh, been speaking a bit around today around dispute resolution and uh, obviously the, the framework is there around land access so that um, you know, to encourage that early communication and they've been a two way street and, and that is reflected in the land access code as well through those best practice uh, guidance um, uh, aspects within that. Um, OK, so last but certainly not least of our presentations today is Daniel Phipps of the Department of Environment and Science. So Daniel is a principal community engagement officer. Uh, now prior to this role, uh, Daniel had several years delivering Ag Force's community information sessions on CSG negotiations across the state. Now, Daniel's presentation will provide an overview of the role of the Department of Environment and Science uh, as the state's environmental regulator. And this will include the uh, application assessment process for new projects and highlighting opportunities uh, or avenues for communities to have their say. So without further ado, over to you, Daniel. Thank you very much, Steve, and um, thank you for organising this webinar. I'm glad to be here to present on behalf of the Department of Environment and Science. So as the Department of Environment and Science, or DES, we have responsibilities across a broad range of portfolio, including the environment, science, uh, and the Great Barrier Reef. And we are Queensland's environmental regulator. And as such, we work very closely with other agencies involved in regulating the resources industry, including the Department of Resources, to monitor, manage, uh, and assess the impacts of the industry on the environment. We're a statewide agency and we have offices located across the state. We also have a dedicated community engagement team with offices located in regional centres across Queensland. And our role is to ensure the community have access to understand the assessment processes, the compliance processes and the decision making processes that the department applies in regulating the industry. Uh, and we're available to help people understand those processes and we encourage you to contact us with questions or concerns or understanding how to navigate through the, the um, responsibilities. Um, in terms of the role that DES plays in regulating the industry, I just want to touch briefly on some of the stuff that we will do, but I mainly want to talk a lot about the assessment process and the opportunities for community and stakeholders to have a say and influence the decisions that we make as a regulator. So our responsibilities are vested in the Environmental Protection Act. We have uh, a regulatory obligation looking at impacts on the resource, from the resources industry on the environment. And we do this through a range of tools, including permit administration. We look at the application assessment process. We conduct environmental compliance against permits and legislation. We do proactive environmental monitoring, and we also reactively respond to environmental incidents across the state. <clears throat> DES also regulates impacts to underground water, and this is a process that can, uh, occurs concurrently with the environmental authority or, or a permit that's issued, issued to operators. And it includes assessment and compliance against key activities, including underground water impact reports, bore assessments and bore studies, uh, as well as make good agreements and um, associated um, dispute resolution processes. Now, the main theme of my presentation this afternoon is to talk about the permitting process that the department uh, manages, as well as the processes and abilities for the community to have a say and submit um, feedback on applications. So what we call environmentally relevant activities, these are activities that have the potential to impact on the environment. And these activities must be issued with a permit called an environmental authority or an EA. 
Now, the EA is issued under the Environmental Protection Act and it must be issued before any activity can, can begin and it imposes conditions to avoid or minimise potential environmental impacts from activities. And the Environmental Authority is a very important document that outlines the way in which companies conduct their activities, the restrictions and the application by which they undertake their activities, but it also sets the goalposts that we measure performance and we monitor compliance against. So understanding what the permit condition contains for any activities on your property is a very important first step. Now, in terms of the assessment processes, when there is a public notification stage attached to an EA or an uh, Environmental Authority application or a major amendment to an existing application, there is the ability to provide a submission to the department on this process. Now, not all new EAs or amended EAs will require a notification stage. The key reasons for a project that does require public notification um, being triggered is in relation to the potential level of environmental harm caused by those proposed activities. Now, some applications or amendment may require public notif notification by the proponent, um, and they may also require notification by the department. And through the assessment process that we conduct, we take these submissions into consideration during that process, as well as information that's submitted by the proponent and subsequent information that may be asked for during the assessment process. Now, <clears throat> this slide provides a, uh, an example of an assessment process that we may progress through, noting that each notification process varies on the type of application that has been made uh, and the determination of the potential level of environmental harm or risk proposed by the activities. So once the application is made or the amendment application is made to the department, we'll review the application, we'll review the information in relation to the obligations under the Environmental Protection Act and any subordinate legislation. If there's more information that's needed, we'll enter into a uh, information request stage where the department may request further information from the applicant to allow us to holistically and confidently assess the potential environmental impacts from the proposed activities and look at how the company are proposing to mitigate or manage those potential impacts. If it's triggered, then the application progresses into the public notification stage. And during this process, there's a 20 business day period uh, by which the public or anybody can make a submission and provide feedback to the application or the amendment. And that's during the application stage. At the conclusion of that process, during the decision stage, the department considers all the materials that have been received. We look at the submission process, we review the original application documents, the potential further information request information, as well as any technical specialist information that we receive. And we consider all of that information on whether to approve the application uh, or the um, request for an amendment. Now on the department's website, you can find a list of all of the current environmental authority applications or amended environmental authority applications. You can search by company name. You can also look at government uh, locality. It will show you the type of activity that the permit is seeking to be authorised to carry out. And importantly, it will also show you the application documents that have been provided to the department around the activities they're seeking to undertake. So if you're looking to understand more about the application, how they're planning to carry it out, what is involved in the application and the potential environmental implications of those activities, as well as the mitigation and management strategies put forward, then this is a really important portal that we encourage you to review and it provides up-to-date information. And for key projects or major amendments, it will also show you the public notification stages. And as a department, we're working to improve our transparency and providing more detailed, dedicated information around specific projects to help assist in this process. As I mentioned, you can make a submission where there is a public notification stage for amendments or new applications. We have uh, provided a submission template that allows you to provide your submission in a more um, easily form to send through the, to the department, but it's not mandatory that you use this, use this template. Submissions can be sent to us by mail or by email, and we have various dedicated teams within the department 
that are available to assist you navigate through the submission process, to understand the details of what's been applied for, the potential environmental impacts, uh, as well as work through the assessment processes as a department that we, that we follow. One of the other useful tools that we have on our website is the uh, department public register. Now this includes information about all the environmental authorities, whether they're current or under amendment or application. It also includes all of the plans of operations for activities being conducted in the space. It also includes all the supporting and subsequent um, application documents for environmental authorities that have been applied for, approved or are under, um, under assessment. Uh, and it also provides information provided to DES uh, that is required by the conditions of the environmental authority and also lists information about enforcement actions that we're launching as a department in relation to non-compliances either with an EA condition uh, or with broader environmental legislation in, in Queensland. Now the Queensland Government is committed to giving the community greater access to information and the way we're trying to do this is by using the right to information services that are available. So any information that is not available on our public register, you can view the right to information services portal on our website to understand about this process. There's also a dedicated team within the department that can help you understand um, how this process works, the restrictions, the process and the costs involved uh, and can help you look at options to gather information that may not be available through the public register. One of the other portals that we also have available uh, that we encourage you to access is the Environmental Authority Location Tool, which is a spatial portal. So what this allows you to do is to look at environmental authorities that have been granted or are under application in your area. Uh, it tells you the permit details, the status, if it's been granted and effective. It tells you the primary company that's holding to it. Uh, it tells you the type of environmental authority that have been applied for. And it also allows you to link to download the environmental authority um, application or environmental authority details. And it's a really important tool that you can use to look at activities in your area that you can then link to our EA portal to download more information around a specific project. Or if you're looking for opportunities for submission, it's also a good place to start. One of the other supporting tools that we encourage you to look at is on the Queensland Globe. Now it has a whole lot of information in relation to the, the resources industry in Queensland. It's a great tool that allows you to look spatially around the type of tenures or permits that have been approved or under application or in consideration in your area. It tells you the type of resources that they may be looking for, if it's a coal permit or if it's a mineral exploration permit or a gas permit. Um, it'll highlight areas in terms of expansion into production tenures. It'll provide information around when the tenure was granted, when it expires, the company that holds it, uh, as well as providing links to the associated environmental authority that attaches to that tenure, which provides again, the guidance of how they carry out their activities, the permit conditions and the environmental monitoring that's required and what we monitor compliance for as a department. In terms of contacting our team, we have a dedicated assessment team within DES that can be contacted on the details above. They can provide in any information in relation to the assessment process. If you'd like to talk about um, an amendment or a new application that's been made to the department, this is how you access information. We also have a dedicated pollution hotline reporting service by which you can report environmental incidences to the department 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And we really encourage the community to be involved in the process as it provides us with valuable environmental intelligence that allows us to action on environmental incidents as soon as possible. And there's also an online form that you can also lodge um, odour reports or nuisance reports if it's a particular source of dust or odour or light. Um, it also provides another avenue to contact the department. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, thank you very much. And a bit of feedback. Apologies for that. Um, so uh, wonderful. Thank you very much, Daniel. I appreciate that uh, very informative presentation. Uh, just going through uh, Desi's role in the environmental regulation and, and the, uh, I guess, the environmental approval process. And, and it's good to know that that's open uh, to public input and, and scrutiny through those submission processes.
Um, so look, that, that concludes the presentations component of today's information session. Uh, we'll now move into the question and answer section of the session. So before we kick off, just as a reminder, um, again, you can submit questions in the Q&A via the question mark icon on the taskbar. It should be at the bottom of your screens uh, when you hover your, your mouse or your cursor over it. Um, so uh, we'll try uh, to answer uh, as many as we can today. But as I mentioned earlier, if we don't get round to your question, we will follow up with you afterwards. So um, I'll be reading out the questions and then directing them to the appropriate speaker for a response. Uh, and uh, as mentioned earlier, um, technology being the wonderful thing that it is, um, we may see some small delays just as we direct the responses to our various speakers uh, located across the state. So uh, without further ado, I will um, kick, kick off. Um, so we'll start off with um, a question for Andrea. Um, and um, asking where we can find the land access ombudsman's flowchart infographic. Uh, I do believe it's on our website, uh, but uh, we can certainly uh, email or send a copy out if, if it's needed. Wonderful. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Andrea. Um, and next question uh, goes over to Luke. Um, so this question is no area of the White Bay Burnett is mapped as priority living areas nor priority ag. Would this trigger a rider? Uh, I think you were just on, on mute there, Luke. Sorry, I was just um, confirming my understanding of a rider is a regional infrastructure development approval. So uh, in particular, priority living areas and uh, priority ag land are mapping layers from uh, that are put on the system. So I'm probably fairly familiar with the Gimpy one at the moment because we're dealing with some matters around there. So if you have a look at my mind's online mapping system, it shows up as a restricted land. And if you delve further detailed into that, it will show it as a urban uh, living area. And uh, that restricted area prohibits applications at this point while that regional development plan is currently underway for the White Bay Burnett. Thank you, Steve. Sweet. After all that, I put myself on mute. How about that? Um, thank you very much, Luke. Um, and if we don't mind, we might stay um, with you uh, for another one here. Um, I can see. Um, so it says here um, for Luke, exploration permits were granted around Bigenden in September. I've been contacted by locals near Mount uh, Wawunga National Park. EPM suggests any mineral locals wonder is it copper or gold? Thanks, Steve. Uh, the way the uh, the regulatory framework works in Queensland is that uh, expiration permits are granted for either coal, specific coal, or granted for all minerals other than coal. So, uh, and generally, most uh, expiration companies don't particularly target a mineral, they target any particular mineral uh, where they think that there's a viable product, um, and they just normally target an anomaly, and uh, that's generally how they work. But uh, we wouldn't know specifically uh, what they're targeting because that's not the way the regulatory framework works. Thanks, Steve. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Luke. Um, and uh, look, you're, you're very popular at the moment, Luke. Um, got one more for you here, if you don't mind. Um, it says uh, 6.7 jobs per $1 million invested in mining projects in the White Bay Burnett. Uh, 1,700 jobs for uh, $1 billion investment. Seemed high to me. What reference was Luke using? Thanks, Steve. Uh, the slide that I was using for those numbers is actually referenced off the Queensland Resources Council website, uh, so they compile those figures. But the numbers around jobs are referring to both direct and indirect jobs. It's not specifically those related just to production or exploration. It's the uh, indirect and indirect, direct and indirect jobs. Thanks, Steve. All right. Thanks very much, Luke. Um, and look, I'll actually take on the uh, the next one. Um, 
it was a uh, a question that is um, uh, I guess more of a more a comment in in a way. Um, just uh, saying that you know the focus today is on um, dispute resolution, um, and uh, it, it, it uh, can paint a bit of a negative picture. So look, just to um, to mention that, then uh, yeah, we do have we have had uh, people. Uh, our presenters talk a bit about the dispute resolution options available uh, today. And what we really want to get across, I guess, is that um, look, you've got a, a very comprehensive framework out there to uh, that encourages a good communication and respectful dialogue and the building of that trust and the building of um, a, a two way street there between uh, the resource company and, and the landholder. Um, and, and look, you know, it's it's all there set up uh, through that graduated negotiation process, through the different checks and balances that are in the system that we've uh, discussed a bit today across the different uh, departments. Um, it's all there to, to, to help that along. However, um, just on, on small occasions, um, sometimes things, things don't go as planned. And so uh, one of the real things we wanted to get across today is in those situations, those do, that sometimes can be quite challenging situations, that there are these options available, that there is this support available, um, whether you're a, a landholder or, or a company um, that they, that exists there to uh, to support the the, the parties um, and uh, and hopefully get a, a mutually beneficial outcome. Um, right, I'll I'll have a look for uh, another one. Um, so uh, one for Daniel. Um, the question is, uh, is it possible to get a historical search of environmental authorities? For example, uh, what uh, the EA was, the environmental authority was three years ago versus now? Yeah, thanks, Steve. Um, look, we, we certainly do keep a record of all of the amendments that have been made to an EA, and we do keep a record of changes in terms of applications. So, uh, whilst it may not be available on the Environmental Authority Register, which has current and applied for EAs, you can certainly contact the PALM team, which is the, um, the email address at the end of my presentation, and they'll be able to answer that question for you. Wonderful. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so I will um, answer uh, another question here. Uh, the question is, I have to expand this. Um, uh, when will the government be seriously reviewing the RPI Act um, so uh, to actively protect prime agricultural land and water supplies? Now, look, um, it's, it's it's outside my remit to answer that, so I'm afraid I can't. Uh, I, I, what I should explain with that is uh, it's it's a different area of, of government, so my uh, knowledge of it is not uh, detailed. However. Um, what I can say is at the moment um, the uh, Gasfields Commission Queensland uh, are undertaking a, a review of the assessment process as it relates to uh, gas. And uh, obviously the focus of today is, is not that, but there is that review um, going ahead um, at the moment. And that came out of uh, a recent, um, earlier in this, this calendar year, uh, Queensland um, Audit Office um, a review of the uh, regulatory framework and and the management of, of coal seam gas activities. So so that's a, a positive thing. Um, I will look through some more questions. Um, I will I will take on another one here. So. Um, there's a question, can a landholder refuse a confidentiality agreement? Now, look, I'm, I'm not a lawyer and I can, certainly can't provide any uh, legal advice. Um, it's a uh, it's an independent um, negotiation and it's a, a two way street. So um, I think uh, e either parties in that are able to um, bring um, their um, requirements or requests and their, their preferences to the table in the, that negotiation. Um, I will look elsewhere for some more that I'll be able to um, get some answers to. Just bear with me.
So I can't see any further ones at this point. Um, please, please send through um, your questions. We'd very much like to um, answer them. Okay, um, look, we're, we're uh, struggling for um, additional uh, questions at this point. Um, so, um, but look, you know, hopefully that, that sounds like it's a, a good thing, hopefully, that uh, you've hopefully got enough information, good information from the various presenters today. Um, it's, uh, uh, we will, um, in that case, we may even um, uh, wrap the session up um unless we get any uh, further questions in today um if any more questions come through then as i mentioned we will be more than happy to to follow up and get back to you uh, about um particular questions that, that you have um and uh, as i said this these sessions are a collaboration between um, our department the department of resources and the department of environment uh, the gasfields commission queensland uh, the Land Access Ombudsman and Land Court Queensland. So um, we, we sincerely hope that you found this session today very valuable. Um, I can say that there will be more uh, resource community information sessions in the future. And uh, this may be led by different entities uh, across this collaboration, but all with a similar aim of raising awareness uh, of key resource related topics. Um, now, a, uh, a final reminder, please fill out the electronic feedback survey. Um, the live link has now been posted, I understand. So uh, once you've clicked on it, uh, you can complete it after the session has finished. Um, shouldn't take long at all. So um, it's so valuable to us to help us improve the delivery of these sessions going forward. Um, oh, wait, wait a sec, we've, um, no, no, sorry. Um, I thought we had another question there, but it was a comment. Um, so um, with that, um, we will, um, as I mentioned, we'll follow up today's session with an email containing some useful information. Uh, and we'll also look to upload the recording of today's session in the near future. So we'll let you know when that occurs. Um, thank you again to all of the presenters today and a special thanks to you all, uh, all the attendees today. We realize it's a really busy time of the year. Uh, and that you all have a lot on the go. So really appreciate your time, thank you. Um, and um, we, with that, um, I wish you all a safe and happy holidays. Uh, all the best, thank you.